Tony gives us so many nuggets of information of how he did what he did. He shares a story about how he had a kid when he was 16 and how that shaped his future. Can you imagine that two days before Christmas getting fired from your job and then deciding in the next year, hey, we're taking the, I'm taking the whole year off and we're focusing all in our short-term rental business. You know, luckily my wife, she's like the, the most supportive person I've ever met in my life. And she has like the, the utmost amount of trust in me and what I'm capable of. And, you know, we had a really serious discussion about what our future looked like. And I said, like, look, like I have a five bedroom cabin in the Smoky Mountains is worth a million bucks. Who's going to long term rent that? Nobody. Right. So whenever we buy and we underwrite a property, we do it exclusively with the focus of buying a property manager, paying them 20 percent. And we're still getting that return. But it's amazing how it's shifted in only four years. And I think the next thing also is the, the amenities that you offer and the, the desired amenities are going to vary from property to property. And we can build that network and put our message out there, even if we're not this dominating force of somebody who has thousands and thousands of units. So I think what a lot of new investors or, or would be investors struggle with is this imposter syndrome. Change your mindset. Because to someone who has an abundance of money, but a lack of time or a lack of desire or a lack of ability, the person that can fill those gaps there, there's, there, it's hard to put a value on that. We have not made a significant mistake. I feel great about them all, but it's just that thing, that, that one singular one focus, you know, the one thing, that book. Yeah. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, it's your boys here, Ryan and Corey with another episode for you. Today we had on a heavy hitter. We have a special guest, Tony Robinson, joining the show. You may know him as the co-host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. He is a real estate investor, educator, content creator, business owner, already mentioned podcast host. And he runs a short-term rental business with his wife, Sarah. And they document every step of their journey on their YouTube channel, The Real Estate Robinsons. They've built a portfolio of over $10 million in the short-term rental space in just about two years, affording them the ability to leave their W-2 jobs and become full-time investors. Yeah, and you've heard a lot from Tony. Like, If you listen to Bigger Pockets, he's, again, the, the, the co-host. But to go into his story, which is really cool, about how he got fired two days before Christmas and then made a decision. And they were in a good financial position at that point, but he made a decision to never go back working another job. And that was in, I believe, 2019, maybe 2020. Uh, whatever it is was in the last couple of years. We talk about it in the show and he just, they just blew up since then. And Tony gives us so many nuggets of information of how he did what he did. He shares a story about how he had a kid when he was 16 and how that shaped his future and just the decisions that he made. And he's just, first of all, he's a brilliant dude. Like, let's just throw that out there. He's a brilliant dude. We were so honored to have him on, but to get to know his background, his personal story, I thought was the best part. We developed a little bit of a relationship with him. I'm just excited for his future to hear more about what he's doing. And he's got a lot of cool things that people can get involved in, in terms of syndicating deals, short-term rentals. Uh, he's buying like a, what do we call like it? A hotel. Yeah. A hotel. It's kind of like a short-term rental hotel, yeah. 23 unit out in California. Um, just overall, he has a lot of things going. He's a very analytical guy. You can tell the way he like carries himself, but as you mentioned, him walking us through his personal story, I think a lot of people are going to resonate with it. He came, you know, he built himself up. He tried a lot of different things. And then two, can you imagine that two days before Christmas getting fired from your job and then deciding in the next year, hey, we're taking the, I'm taking the whole year off and we're focusing all in our short-term rental business. Granted, they had a couple of properties under their belt. So they knew the way of the, the run of show, but they went him, he and his wife went all in and, and they're, you know, if you look at him now, like he's the host of the, the Bigger Pockets Rookie Show, but also financially free at 31. 31. Yeah. I mean, it's just another great story that we have on here, but this one was pretty special for us. Um, I think we should bring Tony in, but before we do that, I just, we talked about this. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, but we did get a short-term rental under contract to you and I, our first one, we have a bigger deal that we're going to talk about in a future episode. I think we're going to break down probably like an episode with just you and I, as things get rolling here. But I know we posted some, some photos on our, on our Instagram. We're excited about what we're doing, but for now, let's talk about Tony. Let's bring him in and hear more from him. Let's do it. Well, Tony, officially welcome to the weekly juice podcast. Corey and I are so thrilled to have you here and we really appreciate you joining the show today. Hey, Ryan, Corey, I appreciate you guys having me. I've, I've seen some heavy hitters on your show already. So I'm, I'm excited to be one of those one of those guests to join, man. Excellent, man. Well, thank you so much. So if you could give a little brief background on yourself. Obviously, we know who you are, but where you're from, kind of give us your inception story of how you got into real estate investing and how you left your W-2 job. Yeah. So again, my name is Tony J. Robinson. I am a, a husband, a father, a real estate investor, content creator. So a lot of folks know me as the co-host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Show. Um, so, you know, 
bigger pockets, largest like, you know, internet website for everything related to, to real estate investing. So I'm the host of the Ricky show there. Uh, my wife and I run one of the largest short-term rental dedicated channels on YouTube. Uh, so it's the Real Estate Robinson's YouTube channel. Um, yeah, man. So that, that's kind of where I spend most of my time. And then we've got uh, 17 active short-term rentals right now. Uh, we've got another seven that are in like various rehab or setup phases. And then we've got uh, another five new constructions that are that are currently being built out. So we'll be at 30 short-term rentals here. I don't know. I don't know. Like next 12-ish weeks or so. And uh, we we started investing back in 2019. Um, so it's been a been a, a kind of a, a quick journey for us, man. But that's that's kind of where we're at today, and 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 when we got started. Cool, man. And I know that you're known for a lot of your short term. I'm curious about the the kind of this paradigm shift that happened in real mm-hmm. estate because of so much appreciation, a lot of rent growth. Like, what are you seeing on your side of the investing, and why you strictly go after the short terms and stay away, maybe stay away more so from the the long term rentals? At least your focus towards the future. Sure. I mean, so what, what I'll say is that everyone's goals are going to be different. But for me, when I started investing in real estate back in 2019, my initial goal was to leave my W-2 job. And, you know, I, I had a, a pretty healthy six-figure salary. And, um, you know, I knew that I was going to need to to kind of scale quickly and accumulate a lot of units to be able to, to replace that income. So like most folks, you know, my, my initial thought was to do single family long-term rentals. Um, but before I even bought one, I just did the math and I was like, well, you know, shit at a hundred dollars a door, how many of those am I going to need to be able to really replace a six figure income? And it was a lot. And that the timeline to that just didn't seem realistic. So before I even bought that first investment, I started to look at alternative asset classes to see where can I get the best kind of bang for my book? Where can I generate bigger dollars uh, on a monthly basis? And what I landed on was actually not short term rentals, but apartment syndication. So I ended up picking up a book by Joe Fairless. Maybe you guys have heard of it. It's called the best ever apartment syndication book. You know, one of, yep. one of the biggest books out there. And, um, you know, Joe's talking about like how he got started. And he said that he started off with a couple of single family long-term rentals, use that track record per se, to be able to go out and, and raise some money for some single or for some apartment syndications. And then from there, you know, Ashcroft Capital is the, the behemoth that it is today. So I said, okay, cool. If Joe Fairless did it, that's what I'm going to do as well. Um, so I started off buying a few single family long-term rentals just to kind of build, um, build my own, you know, skills and abilities and build some goodwill on the folks that I knew. And, uh, I think we ended up buying four properties out of state. They're all like out of state burrs. And at that point I said, okay, cool. I've got four of these down. Let me try and go and raise some money. That was uh, right when COVID hit. And, you know, pretty much all the deals just kind of dried up from an apartment standpoint and everything we were getting sent was terrible. Um, financing was even harder to come by because we had never done it before. So the terms we were getting were, were just terrible. So long story short, we were sitting on some capital and uh, none of these apartment deals were working out. I had a buddy, a good friend of mine who ended up buying a cabin in the Smoky Mountains. And he said, hey, Tony, I know you're trying to do this apartment syndication thing, but you might want to come look at the short-term rental space. So we we kind of quickly crunched some numbers and said, you know, man, we can get a pretty good return if we go do this. So we bought that first short-term rental uh, in the middle of COVID 2020. Uh, we bought three that first year, uh, bought another nine the second year. And I don't know, we've been closing on like probably like, like a property every month uh, uh, so far this year. Love it, man. I really want to know about your mindset shift because you just mentioned earlier that you left a W, a really high paying W, a well paying W2 job. So yeah. like, when did this come into your head that real estate was going to be your ticket to creating your own legacy and your own uh, version of financial freedom? I knew a long, long, long time ago that I wasn't going to be an employee for my entire life. Um, my dad growing up was an entrepreneur. Uh, my father-in-law, my wife's uh, uh, dad was also an entrepreneur. Um, neither of them like exceptionally, like massively successful. Right. Uh, but they, they, they were, you know, able to provide for themselves by, by kind of grinding out on, on their own. And they always, you know, told both me and my wife, like, Hey, unless you want to get up and go to a job every day, like you need to have some sort of, of business, some sort of passive income. So it was like, it was like hardwired into my brain as a young, like I was a kid in junior high who was like, you know, I had literally, I had a locker in junior high and I would go to Costco and I would buy like this big box of like those red string candies. I'd bag them up individually and I was selling those out of my locker. Like that was me as a kid, right? Um, in, in college, I had a, a tutoring business. So I, I was tutoring myself. I had three other tutors working for me. We would be taking calls. I was marketing on Craigslist and Facebook groups to find people. So I always knew like entrepreneurship was going to be the thing for me. But um, real estate is a capital intensive game to get started. So I knew I needed some money. So essentially it was, it was when I had enough capital to get started 
I was, I was already gearing and ready to go. I just needed the money first. Wow. I have a quick one too. So be, kind of on that and talking about like the high paying W2, I think there's a lot of people like, and I'll give us for an example, like we're building our portfolio now, but there's always going to be that time and it comes into your head like, Hey, when should I leave my W2? Can yeah. you talk to that? And basically like your shift of saying like, Hey, like I'm going full-time investor now. Like when were you comfortable? Was there a certain amount of money you had saved? Just yeah. give us like the back end on that. Because I think a lot of people, especially in our network are at that kind of point, or they're going to be at that point soon where they're like, I need to make the jump. I just don't know if I'm comfortable yet. So my, my story about leaving my job was a, you know, like, like most people, I think a, a critical moment in my life, but it was also one of the scariest moments of my life. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So uh, I started investing again back in 2019. And when I started investing, and we did short-term rentals in 2020, but I kind of had this game plan, right? Where I was going to give myself maybe five years of investing in short-term rentals before I left my job, because I was doing the math and I knew, okay, I can acquire a property every you know, three to six months. And if I acquire this many properties over the next couple of years, that should give me enough cash flow to really offset my W-2 income. So that was my plan, right? At the end of you know 2025, whatever it was, I wanted to, to leave my job. Um, December 23rd, 2020, I get a call from the HR director saying that I'm fired unexpectedly, right? Two days before Christmas. Um, at that point, we had three short term rentals. Um, and, you know, after the initial shock wears off, you know, I, I was literally sitting in, in at the same exact desk when I got that phone call. And, you know, I'm sitting here just kind of stuck on stupid. And, you know, the, the shock kind of wears off. And I walk into, into the master bedroom my wife is at. And I'm like, hey, babe, like this is the, the phone call that I just got. And, you know, luckily my wife, she's like the, the most supportive person I've ever met in my life. And she has like the, the utmost amount of trust in me and, and what I'm capable of. And, you know, we had a, a really serious discussion about what our future looked like. And I said, like, look, I can try and go out and get a job, but I'm probably going to be underpaid. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily enjoy it. And it's going to slow down what we're doing with the real estate business. I was like, or we take the next 12 months, right? This is right at the end of 2020. So I was like, if we take all of 2021 and we just go full force into this real estate business, let's just see how far we can go. And if we're not happy at the end of 2021, I'll go out and I'll get a job. But if we're happy, then I'm going to delete my resume. We never go back, right? And December 31st, 2021, I deleted my resume. We're, we're never going back. So that's what it was for me. I, I, I got pushed out. Now, I will say, guys, that we did have a pretty significant amount of money saved up, right? So we, we could have gone that entire year with no income, and we still would have been fine because of our, our savings. So if we talk about like the, when the timing is right, you definitely want some runway, right? Like we, we literally could have probably gone maybe 36 months with like no income. It would have been fine. And maybe it's not three years for you. Maybe it's one year, whatever it is, but decide what that number is for you. And once you get to that point, then take the lead. Well, it's amazing that just that decision though, like it really came yeah. down to a decision and Ryan and I are not really ready to leave our jobs. We both like our jobs. It's, it's something that provides us income to get us loans. And it's they're both of our jobs are great to us, but there will be a time. We don't know when it is where it, it will, the pendulum will swing to holding us back. And I can feel that getting closer. I don't think it's now, right? So the, I do think that's interesting that you just made the decision, maybe a little bit of a forced decision, but that's okay. You made a decision. And then by putting all of our effort, like I'm thinking if we had an extra eight hours or six hours or whatever it is during the day to really focus on building a portfolio, we could probably destroy the numbers that we're doing right now within a six month time frame. But yeah. that being said, I think that there, there, there is comes a point where a decision will have to be made. And I just think it's, um, it's awesome that you were able to do it and then that it worked out in your favor because a lot of people, it probably doesn't. Um, but so my question here is, I want to talk about the short-term rentals because again, that is like what you're known for. Are, this is more of a philosophy about short-term rentals because we love the model. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious of what I'm seeing in like Atlanta, where, for example, you know, you can only have, I believe, two properties and you're at your, your driver's license, I think has to be tied to both of them or one of them. Something like that is actually potentially going to happen in Philadelphia, where we live. What do you think about the future of the short term rental space? And do you think it's a location dependent thing? Or do you just see that it can work in a lot more areas than people believe? So my, my take is this, right? Um, Airbnb has been around since what, 2007, 2008. It, it's still relatively new. Think about how long hotels have been around, right? It's like when you compare the traditional hospitality industry to Airbnb and Verbo, the, the, the difference is, is crazy. So I think a lot of cities, a lot of local governments, a lot of counties 
haven't really taken the time to figure out how they want to deal with this whole short-term rental uh, explosion that's happened over the past couple of years. So I think we are just naturally, as it gains more popularity, going to see more cities, going to see more counties implement regulations, rules, ordinances around how they want to regulate short-term rentals. Now, does that necessarily mean that it's a bad thing? Not really. Right. It's if a city puts in rules to say, hey, this is how we're going to deal with the short term rentals. As long as you operate within those rules, then you're fine. Right. Now, when we look at like Atlanta, right, Atlanta was, you know, they were, they, they caused a lot of headlines uh, over the past couple of months because they banned a bunch of stuff and, you know, people were losing money left and right. OK, my my philosophy when it comes to investing in short term rentals is I try and pick markets that are economically dependent on the revenue generated by short-term rentals. When you look at Atlanta, one of the largest airports in the world, film and TV, there's literally you know universities, business headquarters, every major economic driver you can think of is present within Atlanta. So do they really care about the revenue that short-term rentals are bringing in? Probably not. If you go somewhere like the Poconos, and you guys, right, you guys are investing there. Yes, sir. Is there, are there any business headquarters in the Poconos? Not that we know of. All right. Are there are there any uh, major universities in the Poconos? Um, not major. University of Scranton is nearby. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like three thousand students at Scranton. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, are there any like shipping ports in the Poconos? There no. are not. So the what is the main thing driving the inflow of money into tourism Poconos? and hospitality? You got tourism it. and hospitality, right? So would it be in the benefit of whatever local government is running the short-term rental ordinances for the Poconos to say, hey, we're going to severely limit or ban the number of short-term rentals that can operate in that town? No. It would make it would make no sense. And let me tell you how happy I was to learn before the show that you were actually looking in the same market that we are. So <laughs> <laughs> shout out to you for that one. Yeah. Right. But no, absolutely right. I mean, you're you're correct. And, and that's what I look for when I try and invest in, in a market, right? Um, I live super close to Los Angeles. So I'm like 45 minutes away from LA, but I don't know if we'll ever buy in LA for that same reason, because LA has literally every single economic driver you can think of. So do they care about protecting short-term rentals? No. So when I go into a market, I'm looking for places that are primarily driven by vacation and tourism, people coming in, staying for a night and then leaving. Absolutely love that. And thank you. That, that kind of helps us too. I feel very, even stronger about where we're investing, but kind of on the same token, um, I want to talk about, there's a lot of people that say, well, listen, when I analyze my, my short-term rental deals, I want to make sure this rents for the long-term too, or else it's not a safe, safe play. And I don't want it. What's your, what's your take on that? Do, does something need to be able to be able to balance each other out? Like your short-term rentals, do they have to be able to rent for long-term or is that just uh, kind of a myth? So let me, let me ask you guys another question. Um, if you, you know, if you're Hilton, I said that you guys are Hilton. Do you guys think that Hilton, before they go out and build a hotel, are they saying we're only going to build this hotel if it also works as an apartment building? Absolutely not. They would be out of business fast. Right. Like the primary purpose of a Hilton hotel is for short term stays. And they understand that when they underwrite, they're using data from the hospitality industry to support their underwriting on that asset. I use that same philosophy when I do short term rentals as well. I'm not buying this as a potential long-term rental. I'm buying it primarily exclusively to operate as a short-term rental. Most of the markets that I'm in are true vacation destination markets. So none of them would make sense as, as a long-term rental because no one's no one's living there long-term, right? Like I have a five-bedroom cabin in the Smoky Mountains that's worth a million bucks. Who's going to long-term rent that? Nobody, right? So whenever we buy and we underwrite a property, we do it exclusively with the focus of will its perform as a short-term rental. And we understand that there is some inherent risk in doing it that way, but that's our business model. That's the industry that we're in. And, and the whole short-term rental business model is it's hospitality and um, experience-based, is it not? Like right. it's not yeah. about staying for the long-term and like building a home. It's, it's having that one-time, two-time, three-time experience where you're like, you're escaping the real world to go to these places, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a totally different business model, right? I mean, at, and at the end of the day, it is it is more of a business than a traditional long term rental, right? There's a an ele there's an element of marketing that's involved. There's a design element that you have to do. There's con consistently pricing your property and looking at the competition. So there's a lot more that goes into it. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the the two, even though they're both, you know, using a single family house, the underlying business practices are are very different. Well, that being said, Tony, I think uh, I know. 
that you have Joshua Tree, California, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and I'm sure I maybe have missed a couple of markets that you're in, but what do you think separates you or what, what advice could you give somebody who's looking to get into the game that could separate their properties from a space that has more and more investors entering into that on the daily on, you know, or monthly, whatever it is to, to make sure that you can have a profitable short-term rental business just like you do. Yeah. I mean, here, here's the first thing that, that I'll say to that is that uh, I, I do think that over the next five to 10 years, the returns in the short-term rental spirits are going to get compressed, right? Like, like we have a property right now that's on track to give us a 76% cash on cash return. And wow. I, I, I don't think that, you know, five to 10 years from now, we'll be able to replicate that on a consistent basis. But a lot of our properties, the majority, every single property we own is going to give us at least 30% cash on cash return. And, and like I said, some of those even, even in the seventies. Um, but as more people enter into this asset class, you are going to see, uh, I think it become a little bit more difficult to get some of those astronomical returns. Now, does that mean it's impossible? Absolutely not. But it will become more difficult. I think before you could like, you know, throw a dart and get lucky and you're, you're going to get, you know, 50% cash on cash return. Now you do have to run it a little bit more like a business. So to, to answer the question, um, if we want to be competitive in a market, the first thing that we're going to do is see who is winning in that market. There's, there's data tools out there. We use Price Labs to do a lot of our, our market research. And in Price Labs, you can literally go in, type in a city, and then it'll show you all the listings in that city. And you can literally sort it by revenue over the last 365 days. And if you do that, you're going to see, okay, here's what all the, the top performing properties are doing in this market. And then all you have to ask yourself is, can I beat them? And maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to be at the top because it's cost prohibitive, but if maybe you want to be like the 75th percentile, okay, what do I need to do to compete at this level? Because it's a different guest is going to pay a thousand dollars a night versus the guest is paying $200 per night. So I think first decide where you want to land. And once you, once you kind of decide where you're going to be at, see what these other properties are doing and understand how you can beat them. I think it's really interesting that you brought that up because I used to, even in 2018, when I bought my first property, I'm thinking that 20 to 30% return or cash on cash return was what I was looking for in the long-term space. And you are not coming close to that in the long-term space, at least in the single family area today. We just put a property under contract and then we're going to talk about it, whether it's this episode or an upcoming episode there, the projected short-term rental return is about 30%. Mm -hmm. And to have that over a lot more work, right? We're hiring a property manager, paying them 20%. And we're still getting that return, but it's amazing how it's shifted in only four years. And I'm sure you've mm-hmm. seen that in your markets too, which would lead me to believe that it is going to get more compressed, like like you said, down the line. But that's why it's like for us or anybody listening, lock in as much debt as you can right, right. now, just because this inflation thing is not really going to go away. Hopefully it comes down a little bit, but real estate has always been a hedge against it. And I don't think people are going to stop traveling because if COVID was if they didn't stop traveling to these destinations during COVID, then unless we have some apocalyptic nightmare, like I don't right. think they're going to stop traveling. It, yeah. Well, we saw this when we were researching short-term rentals, like for example, up in the Poconos, it'd be like four years ago, some of these properties, for example, sold for 150 grand and now they're listening for 350. And right. it's because the people came in for a year, posted that they could, they had revenue, a lot of revenue coming in as a short-term rental business. And then they're just posting it, re- reposting it for sale for a get right. $200,000 profit. It's absolutely insane. And we kept seeing this. We're like, what is this theme? Is like the same guy, like d- has a, like <laughs> 40 properties. And we, we, you know, we it's probably we learned a, the market trends, but it was insane. That yeah, it's probably running. a flip it, like a, a flipping strategy too. If somebody knows that there's going to be an influx of Airbnbs, they go in there, they, they make them pretty, they flip them totally. and then they sell them to Airbnb investors like us. I don't know if you've seen that in the markets that you're in, but we've noticed that we're looking at some of these photos. I'm like, why is this person selling this property? property. And the reason that they're selling it, I think is because they don't have the systems to manage the actual Airbnb. They may have just fixed it up themselves. So that's, we we noticed that. Yeah. I want to talk about um, just like setting your properties apart. I know there's so much that goes into like a short-term rental business and we can kind of break it down, but we don't have to go into all the nuances. I'm just thinking of, I've watched, like I said, before the show started, I watched all your episodes on, on your YouTube channel. It's incredible. So um, the real estate Robinson. So go check it out. If you're listening, it's incredible. You can take it from Corey and I, we, you, he's basically a, um, a case study for us. And we used his examples and tips and tricks to, and we to downloaded get our, the calculator and all that. <laughs> yeah, we did. We downloaded the calculator. So there's a lot of, a lot of freebies and nice things on there. So go check it out. But what I wanted to, to ask is what, 
kind of based off Corey's questions, like setting yourselves apart, right? Do you guys look for like number of bedrooms? Are you posting like an Instagrammable wall? Like what is setting your business apart from other short-term rental investors out there that just saying like, Hey, like I would want to stay there. And I know maybe this can also, you can talk to the listing, right? It's all about the pictures, but I'm just wondering about that experience when people come through the doors, like what, why would go, we go to the Robinson's properties versus someone else's? Yeah. I mean, what I will say first is that I, I love our, our Joshua Tree properties from like a design aspect more than our cabins. Um, our cabins are pretty traditional. You know, they're just big location views. Uh, that's what drives a lot of what's happening uh, in the Smoky Mountains. You are starting to see folks get a little bit more creative in that market. Joshua Tree is like a very architecturally, you know, artistic uh, unique experience type driven uh, market, right? And, th- and that goes to say like every market is going to demand something different. Like, I don't know if I could take my tiny house in Joshua Tree, plop it into the Smoky Mountains and have the same type of returns that we get. And obviously vice versa, if I take a five bedroom cabin and stick it in the, in the middle of the desert, no one's going to book that either. So every traveler has a different desire when they go to, to each market. So I think the first thing you need to understand is what, what is drawing people to that market? What kind of design aesthetic do they want? And then what we typically try and do is we try and push the boundaries just a little bit, right? So that we can separate ourselves a, a little bit more. So like, for example, um, there's a, a lot of properties in Josh Tree that have like a, a boho chic uh, kind of design to them. And, you know, some of our properties do have that, but we try and add like you know, like pops of color and we'll have like a, a bright orange roof and, you know, we'll, we'll have like a dope, we literally have like muralists come in, like paint murals in the walls and the carports. Um, so just anything to kind of make the property stand out. We'll get like cool custom made neon signs. Um, just anything so that as people are looking through those properties um, on Airbnb, our photos kind of stand out a little bit. Um, I think the next thing also is the the amenities that you offer and the the desired amenities are going to vary from property to property. Um, in Palm Springs, California, which is is about 40 minutes south of Joshua Tree, um, almost every property needs to have a pool in Palm Springs to be competitive, right? Joshua Tree, just a few miles north, almost no listing has a pool, right? The vast majority do not have pools, but you're still able to be competitive. Um, in the Smoky Mountains, every single cabin that's large has a, a hot tub, a game room, and a movie theater. You don't have those things, it's gonna be hard for you to compete. So I think as you go into your market, start looking at the other listings to see what kind of amenities are they are they offering? So that way you know what to incorporate into your property and see if you can do one better by giving it an, an, an even better experience than those other listings do. I love that. I, I wanna know now maybe if you're willing to share a little bit more details on like a, uh, a 2022 version of what you might be looking for and what you can expect from a return. Let's just use Joshua Tree as an example. Like if you're going to buy a property now, and we've learned recently that people can do this with second home loans and do 10% down, and it's not that expensive, at least on a couple, you know, you, I don't know how many times you can do that. Probably not a lot, but to get into, a, you know, your first short-term rental, let's say you were to go out there and you wanted to buy a property. Can you give us a price range, maybe an expected return on something that you would look for? You would, okay, say, I'm going to go buy this here in 2022. So from a returns point, I think we're, we're still closing on deals where we're projecting north of a 30% cash on cash return. Um, I still think that's very doable in today's market. Now, every investor is going to have different targets, right? Some people might be happy with a 20% return because they were getting 8% on their long-term rental, right? So I think everyone's going to have different, but 30% is like a baseline for us right now. Uh, In terms of price point, again, that's going to vary from market to market. When we first went into the Smoky Mountains, you know, just kind of doing doing our analysis, what we realized is that the four and five bedrooms were the sweet spot in that market because the, the price difference from a five to a six was pretty big, but the revenue difference was pretty small. And on the flip side, the price difference from a three to a five was relatively small, but the revenue difference was relatively big. So we found out that four to five was the sweet spot. Our, and on the flip side, the majority of our portfolio on Joshua Tree, they're 391 square foot tiny houses, right? Exceptionally small, but they are absolutely crushing it. We have some months where the tiny homes do just as good as our three bedrooms, right? So every market is going to have that sweet spot where you look at price versus revenue. And it's hard for me to say what that is anywhere, but typically when we go into new market, we're trying to identify what that sweet spot is. 
Cool. I really like that. Can you talk to talk about building one's like short-term rental team? I think a lot mm-hmm. of people are going to be investing outside of the market that they live in, right? Yeah. It's a vacation home. It's a second home. And so it's daunting to be like, how the heck am I going to build the team? First of all, who, who does the team comprised of? And then how do I build that team? And, you know, it could be like two, 3000 miles away. So we, we bought our first short-term rental uh, living in California. That property was in, in Tennessee. So like, like you said, it was like 2,200 miles away from, from where we lived. And honestly, to be able to manage remotely, there's two people you need. You need a, an extremely reliable cleaner because they are, they are by far the most important person on your team. And then you need a, a skilled handyman. Uh, the cleaner, they're your, your eyes and your ears. Uh, they're, they're your first line of defense. They're the last person to see the property before a guest checks in. They're the first person to see your property once a guest checks out. So they're, they're your, your data provider for everything related to your property. So you need a reliable cleaner. Me personally, I would not hire a cleaner that is a one man or one woman show. I want to see at least like you know, a group of cleaners that are working together. So like in every market that we work in, we have like a a lead cleaner that we coordinate with, but that lead cleaner might have three to four cleaners that work with her. So in Joshua Tree, we've got like, dude, we've got like, I don't know, like nine people cleaning our properties in Joshua Tree. I think Miss Smokey is like a group of like like four people. Um, So I I never want to have a single point of failure with my cleaning. Because like, say that your your cleaner calls in today, they're like, hey, Ryan, Corey, sorry, I'm sick. And it's 11 o'clock, you have a guest checking in at four, what are you going to do if you only have one cleaner? So we always want to make sure that we have a team uh, behind those cleaners. Now, in terms of how you find those folks, there's a couple of ways you can go, right? Um, I think the best way is a referral from an existing owner operator in that market, right? Like if you can find someone that already has an Airbnb that has a cleaner that they're, they're super happy with, that's the best way to go. But a lot of people aren't going to give you that information. Like if anyone messages me right now and says, Tony, can I get your cleaner's information? I'm going to no say, shot. No, no way. Right. <laughs> because that's how important they are to me. And we have so much growth happening in our business. I need to make sure that they can, they can absorb the properties that we're bringing online. So, but if you can find someone that's willing to give you that recommendation, that's what I would go with first. Second, if you're in a vacation destination market, like the Poconos, ask your realtor. A lot of realtors who are her seasoned in that market, they know cleaners, right? Because they've sold, they've they sold and bought a lot of property. So that's a good way to go. Third place is online, Facebook uh, uh, groups, uh, bigger pockets, like wherever you can go to find people talking about that market. See if you can just like type in cleaner into that Facebook group and see who pops up. And then the last place would be sites like, I don't know, like a like Thumbtack or Turnover BNB or Angie's List, uh, some of those online marketplaces that that have those kinds of services. Very cool. Before we get into, we're going to get, hopefully get into one of your deals here really soon and kind of go through the fine tooth comb. But I want to talk briefly about um, you and your, your wife's partnership, right? There's a lot of people that are out there that a have a spouse that they want to partner together, but also on the other side of the flip of the coin is there's people that are searching for partners and they don't have someone that they can talk to about this and they're, they're avidly looking. So can you talk about kind of what roles each you and your wife play in the business and why you're so successful? Cause you each have your own lane and then B how does one find a partner that they can, you know, go in on a deal with and trust. And, you know, in day, today's day and age, it might not be someone in your own state. It might be someone online. So just curious on your thoughts. So in terms of how our business is set up today and how we how we kind of divide the responsibilities, our, our team has grown a bit since we first started. So we have myself, my wife, um, we have an operations manager, we have an investor relations manager, uh, we have three virtual assistants that run kind of the front end guest communication. Uh, we have one bookkeeping uh, VA, uh, we have an acquisitions person as well. So we've kind of, you know, as our... T- as our business to scale, we've kind of need to start plugging people into these different spots. But when we first started, it was just us, right? And, and we were kind of doing everything. Um, so I'm typically the person that, that was focused on like the underwriting, the analyzing, finding the deals, the numbers, the systems, the software, the tools. Uh, my wife was more so focused on like the the design, the guest experience, uh, communicating with the guests, getting them up and going. Uh, and then we have a third partner who helped to start the business. And he was like paying all the vendors and like scheduling the guy to come fix the, fix the HVAC when it went out. And, you know, we needed this, this repair maintenance done. So we all kind of just naturally gravitated towards our, our different uh, parts of the business that align with our, our original skill sets. Um, now, t- to answer the second question about like, what can someone do today? We we live in a world where we are so 
uh, like, like you guys have heard the phrase, like seven degrees of, of separation. Like that doesn't yep. exist today. Right. It's like two degrees now at most. Yep. Right. Like there's someone in your network who knows someone else that can probably solve whatever problem it is that you need, uh, need to have fixed. So if you're not active in, in Facebook groups, if you're not going to the local real estate meetups, if you're not going to the, the, the real estate investing events in your town or, or hopping on a plane and going to a conference somewhere, there are so many people who are in the exact same position as you that are hungry, that are looking for help, that have capital or have the time or have the ability that needs someone to, to join their team. So if you, if you can't find a partner today, it's just because you're not looking hard enough. I, I could not agree more. And I can tell you for a fact, the single biggest factor to us growing our network and expanding was starting to become content creators. And it's not totally. close. It's, and I'm sure you can attest to that because now we have a virtual resume and people trust us. And, and I think they should, because I feel like we're good people. Right. And I feel like we provide value. And, and so, but to put our content out there, look, we're not multimillionaires. Like there's no, like, that's not who we are. So soon, soon, yeah, soon to be, soon to be, but you don't have like, we, we can be trusted and, and we can be, um, and we can build that network and put our message out there, even if we're not this dominating force of somebody who has thousands and thousands of units. So the recommendation that I would give, and, and I'm sure you would agree with this, Tony, is to just start your journey and talk about it and network with other people. Because we had somebody that applied to be a guest on the show, and now we're going to partner with them on a, on a big deal. And that is like, you don't have to start a podcast, right? But if you just start some sort of virtual resume, we're meeting people all across the country. Hell, I don't think you would, and, and, and I could be further apart across the country right now. You're in California, <laughs> we're in Philadelphia. Right. Like, but right. we're having a conversation, building a relationship, making a connection, and who knows what, what could come of that. So I totally agree with that. I think that if you're not, it's, it's really a lack of effort if you're not be able to meet, uh, meet people and start connections with people. Um, you know, with the folks online in 2022. Totally agree. And I have someone, something just to piggyback off that too, is like, we have a lot of people sometimes looking for um, not only partners to like build a, build a business with, but it's raising capital. Right. And we talked about this on our, on our, I guess, pre-show, but can you talk about maybe a deal where you had to, you put zero of your own money down and talk to like raising capital, bringing people in and then kind of the structure of the deal. Cause there's a lot of times where we're getting to the the point we told you a little bit earlier. It's like, Hey, like we're, we're tapped on cash, but we can provide X amount of value. And we want to jump in on deals where we can maybe source all the cash for the deal. Right. And then it's not maybe nothing out of our pocket or maybe a little bit less than, but we still get a share. So I'm wondering if you have a deal that you've done in your portfolio that could, could speak to this, where you had zero out of your own cash and you provided some other type of value. So I want to answer that before I do, I just want to go back to, to what you said, Corey, about the, the platform piece and, and, and why that's so important. Um, so again, a lot of folks know me as the co-host to the, the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Show. Uh, before I was on that podcast, I had my own podcast and it was called Your First Real Estate Investment. I started that show in I think August of 2019. And I didn't get my first real estate deal done until three months later in October. So I had a real estate podcast about investing in real estate before I even ever closed on my first deal. And the reason I, I did that, right. And, and I was very open and transparent on that podcast to say like, hey, I'm a new investor. I want to interview other new investors. And all we talked about was that very first real estate investment, right? So it was a very easy kind of you know, it was a way for me to kind of learn and educate myself anyway. But my, my point is, it was through that podcast that I met the folks at Bigger Pockets. And then when they had an opening for this real estate rookie show, I already had, like you said, this online digital resume of a, my ability to, to be a podcaster. I'd already kind of built a network out of other folks who would be great guests for this show. It was a very natural kind of fit. So I encourage everyone, where even if you haven't closed in that first deal yet, Start start documenting on on you know whatever uh, Instagram TikTok LinkedIn. If you don't like posting videos, dude, I like I know profiles on Instagram that have hundreds of thousands of followers, and all they do is post like one graphic every day about a tweet or something, right? Right, right, or, or a chart or something, right? And you never even see what their faces look like. So find the medium that that works well for you, or even go old school, right? Start a local real estate meetup. What happens if you can have the biggest, you know, real estate meetup in your local area? How many connections do you think you can make if you can get 300 real estate investors to come out to your location once a month? It would have a phenomenal impact. I totally agree. And I think it has to lead with you trying to help others, though. And that's totally. the biggest thing is that we, yeah, selfishly, we'd love to 
uh, uh, to network with Tony Robinson. But, but we also realized that just by talking about our journey, the amount of people that are like, Oh shit, I'm stuck mm-hmm. in that same scenario too. I have eight rentals. I have seven units. I, I need help with this X, Y, and Z. And we're like, look, we're here to help. We're here talking about it. We talked about all the mistakes we made and just be open and upfront. I think people resonate with that over trying to, to coach somebody who doesn't want to be coached. And that, that, that was, I feel like the way that we found to have like a smidgen of success and hopefully it continues, but I, I could not agree more with just start. And, and you, it's funny, you had a podcast and you didn't, and you didn't even about real estate and you had no deals. I, I think it's amazing. And let me, can I, if I can just add one more thing there, I think what a lot of new investors or, or would be investors struggle with is this imposter syndrome of man, why, why would anyone want to listen to Tony? or to Ryan or Corey, right? Like, who am I when they can go listen to Grant Cardone or they can listen to Brandon Turner, they can listen to, you know, Sam Zell or whoever, right? But the point is someone's going to resonate and you said this word, someone's going to resonate with your story in a way that they won't resonate with Grant Cardone, right? Maybe someone sees me and says, man, here's like a young black guy from SoCal, did the grind to go to college. I, I resonate with his story. Or maybe someone sees me and says like, you know, I had a kid when I was 16, maybe someone sees that and they're like, man, I resonate with that part of Tony's story. I, I gravitate towards him. Or maybe someone sees you guys and they're like, I'm also from Philadelphia. I really like the way that these guys are doing things in the Phil. Like there's something about you and your story that no one else can replicate that other people are going to resonate with. So you can't be an imposter if you're just being true to who you are. I, 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 we could talk about this all day and I know we're pressed for time, but I, I could not agree more with that. I think that I can tell you for a fact, I don't resonate with somebody like Grant Cardone. doesn't mean that he's not amazing and provides all this value. But if I were to go to him and be like, Hey, I have eight units. He'd be like, you're like, what are you doing? You know, I have thousands. And I'm like, okay, man, like I'm trying over here. Like, you know, and I just think that there's a level, there's levels to the game, but no one's going to shame you, especially in, in this day and age, uh, we don't see it, at least in the personal finance, investing real estate space, people are not shaming other people for putting themselves out there and trying. And even if they are, then you're in the wrong circle. And that that's, right. that's what we've seen. But um, let me go to the other question there as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so honestly, the, the vast majority of deals we do today are with uh, now none of our own capital. Um, you know, now, now a lot of the capital that we use, it's for uh, kind of funding other projects that we have going on. Um, but like we, we just closed on, I don't know, we've closed on four properties in the last month and all of those were with, uh, without of our, without any of our own capital. And, you know, when you talk about the value that, that we provide there, there are three things I think that someone needs to be a successful real estate investor. It's time, it's ability and it's desire. Right. And we've met a lot of busy working professionals that have the financial ability but they don't have the technical ability, the team ability, all any of the other abilities. They don't have the, the time because they're, they're busy with work commitments, family commitments, whatever it is. And they honestly just don't have the desire to you know, talk to a guest who lost their check-in code, right? That's, that's not how they wanna spend their time. So what we're able to do is give them a beautiful property. They can go visit whenever they want to, get amazing returns on their investment, and use literally zero of their own time. And to them, that's a fantastic return on their investment. Now, there are some people who come to us and want to partner with us. And we're like, like, look, like you can do this yourself. You you have the time. You've you've studied enough. You know a lot about short-term rentals and you seem to be eager to learn. We're not the right partner for you. We tell that to people all the time. The people that we're looking for, they're lacking in either time, desire, or ability. So for you, the folks that are listening, as you're looking for potential money partners, And you're thinking like, why would someone want to partner with me? Change your mindset. Because to someone who has an abundance of money, but a lack of time or a lack of desire or a lack of ability, the person that can fill those gaps, it's hard to put a value on that. Love it. And it's funny, we're starting to do some sourcing uh, money for other deals. I got off the phone with one of my friends today who owns a chiropractic business and he doesn't have time to go out there and try to put together a 40 unit deal. Like he, but he has money sitting waiting and he's looking to invest in, he understands real estate. He has real estate of his own. He has another business of his own. People like that, actually what you just mentioned, Tony, that's actually the easiest part is the money part. And we just learned this within the last probably year or so is that the money is all out there, right? People are looking for, for ways to invest. And if you, somebody like you, Tony, can educate them on where it could be well spent and get a good return. I think that the the passive side of the investing is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Let me, if I can add one thing onto that too, like 
you know, I, I remember for me growing up, you know, I came from like a, a mostly single parent household, you know, me and my mom, you know, it was just the two of us mostly like we didn't have an abundance of money. We didn't go on vacations. You know, I, I we put our clothes on layaway when I went school shopping, you know, like we I didn't I didn't know anybody that was rich in my life, like period. So I know when I would hear people talk about, oh, yeah, just go ask people in your network and you can raise money that way. To me, it was, it was always like a, an insult almost. Right. It's like I don't have anyone like that in my network. But I think that goes back to what we were talking about before of networking, of building your platform, of sharing your journey. Because even if there's no one in your immediate circle today that you think has capital, if you start putting yourself in places where other people who have the same financial aspirations as you do, eventually you are going to find someone that has the financial means to be a good partner to you. So I just want to throw that in there because I know for a lot of folks that are listening, they might not have anyone in their circle yet. But again, if they do the stuff we talked about earlier, they can get there. So talk to us about Alpha Geek Capital and your vision for starting the company. Um, I, and just tell us a little bit about what you do. I think you did explain it in, in the past uh, you know, couple minutes or so. But just give us, give us an idea of what Alpha, Alpha Geek Capital does and, and, and why, you decided to, why you decided to go all in on that. Yeah, so we, we uh, find, uh, buy, and manage uh, short-term rentals, right? Properties in the, the hospitality industry. Uh, we're, we're in the process right now of uh, buying our first hotel as well, and we plan to do more of that in the future. But our ultimate goal is to buy cool properties, give our guests cool experiences, and give our investors a good return. And um, you know, the, the goal behind this company, the reason why we started it is because, um, again, I, I always had the the goal, the vision of building a, a relatively big company, you know, like Brandon Turner, I consider him a mentor of mine to see what he's done with his company at, at Open Door Capital is, is amazing. And I want to be able to replicate something like that, but within an asset class that, that kind of speaks to me. So um, our 10 year goal, uh, by the end of 2032, we want to have a billion dollars in assets under management. And again, that'll be, you know, we'll probably have very few single family, a little bit more of the commercial stuff. Um, but that's, that's the goal that we're moving towards right now. Love that. Now, selfishly, I will say, or maybe not selfishly, but just like peek behind the curtain, I'm on your mailing list. So I get your yeah. deals. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I don't know if it's still available, but just wanted to talk about the the Golden Bear Cottages, the 23 unit. Yeah. And yeah. whether it's available or not, can you just talk to, is that the hotel you guys are buying? Or is, is. what's the, give us like just the structure of it. I think it's so cool. We had Heather Blankenship on a couple of weeks ago and she has, she has this amazing deal. It's like, it's like she bought it for like 2 million, right? 3 million then appraised for 13 million, six years later. <laughs> she had nine different revenue streams coming from this one property. So I just think yeah. it's cool to, to share what people are doing. So can you walk us through kind of some ins and outs on that property? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's a 23 unit cabin resort in the city of Big Bear Lake, California. So uh, Big Bear Lake is like a it's a lake town in Southern California. It's about I don't know an hour and a half outside of Los Angeles, and a pretty big destination for folks in California and outside of California as well. But it's one of the only places here where you can get like lake and snow. Um, so beautiful place, very mature vacation destination as well. Um, the property itself, it's 23 separate cabins uh, all in this one parcel. And uh, it's been owned by the same family since 1999. Fantastic family, super sweet people. Um, but they they haven't made any aesthetic upgrades to the property since 99. And they aren't leveraging Airbnb and Verbo. Um, they're charging people today the same rates. If they have a returning guest, the same rates they were paying like five, 10 years ago. Um, so there's just a lot of upside here in terms of operational efficiencies. Um, so our goal with that property is to close it, uh, completely renovate, each of those 23 units um, and leverage, you know, the OTAs or online travel agencies like Airbnb and Verbo to drive increased occupancy, increased revenue. Um, you also want to do weddings there. Uh, there's a, a wedding space. They've only done, I think, like one or, I don't know, like maybe like three weddings over the last like five years. Um, but, you know, Big Bear is also a wedding destination for folks. So renovations, uh, cool outdoor spaces, wedding venue, and uh, hopefully sell that thing in, in five years and make a good return. Oh, for that's incredible, dude. I didn't even think about having a wedding there. That, that could be an opportunity up in the Poconos too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the coolest thing about like just real estate, the cycles. And I talked about this previously. It's not about, I'm not talking about the market cycles of like the prices going up and down. I'm just mean like, uh, investors that have held on for a long period of time and then decided after 20 years that they want to sell. And then there's just somebody new who comes in and has their spin on it. And that inherently right. can drive the value up of the property. It's an amazing thing. And I just think that that's why we love real estate so much. So, so I have one last one for you and then we'll get to our core four and wrap up the yeah. show. But, um, we've people throw this around pretty lightly, especially content creators and, and real estate investors, virtual assistants. I just want to talk, get on this topic quickly 
how the hell do you hire one? Where do you find them? And like, what's the process for onboarding them? Is it really, can you get them for six bucks an hour, 40 hours a week? Like there's, there's so many questions involved in that. Right. And I'm wondering if you can give us the spark notes of just like, Hey, if someone has the bug or the itch to get something off their plate, how can they go about that? I can tell you the wrong way to do it. Uh, because then this is from experience, right? Cool. Uh, the wrong way to do it is to do something yourself over and over and over again, realize that you hate it, run to Upwork, put up a job post, hire that person, tell them what you want them to do, and then check them with them a month later. That is the that is the wrong way to do it because you have completely set them up for failure, okay? And I know this because of the very first VA that we hired, uh, she was our bookkeeping VA. And, you know, bookkeeping is, is one of those really important tasks that need to be done in the business, but also one of the most like, you know, like... I hate doing it. <laughs> right? So yes. yeah, tedious, you know, like, like, and so we, we knew that that was the first one we wanted to get off our plate. And I did a really poor job of setting her up with um, the, the, the kind of training she needed to understand our business and the rules that we had around what our books should look like. Um, so it took a lot of, you know, after hiring her, me going back and like redoing her work. And there was just a lot of that. Right. Um, so it, now she's kind of up to speed, but when we went back and hired our second round of VAs, we did it in a much more kind of methodical way. Um, so now, whenever I find myself doing something that's below my pay grade, I, I write it down first. So like, hey, this is something that I shouldn't be doing. And then I start recording videos of myself doing it. So that way, when I need to pass it off to somebody, I can just send them a link to this Loom video and now they can watch that and, and they've got a process down of how they need to do it. So as you brought on these other VAs, there's a, a huge library of Loom and not even not for our VAs, even for like our operations manager, she's in North Carolina, right? But she gets, she benefits from that as well. So anytime I find myself doing something that I know I eventually need to pass off to someone, I try and take the time to slow myself down, record a quick video, plug it away. And then when someone needs it, I can shoot it off to them. Love Perfect. That, that was awesome. concise to a T. Thank you. Um, and then you said Upwork is, is where you find them. And after you have the Loom videos built, yeah, so we found the majority of our our, our VAs through Upwork, yeah, and okay. yes, you can find VAs for six bucks an hour. Even better, perfect, <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, um, I guess we want to talk. We already gave us the story of kind of how you got into bigger pockets. The last thing was, I know you guys have a short term rental summit coming up. You and your wife, you want to talk to that real quick? Just give it a little plug and how people can get involved. Absolutely, man. So we were super excited about this. Um, so September 11th through the 13th in Newport Beach, California, uh, my wife and I are hosting the Short Term Rental Summit. It is uh, two and a half days to pretty much walk people through exactly what they need to do to start, manage, and scale their own short-term rental business. Uh, my wife and I will be talking. We'll have our interior designer on stage. We'll have our lender on stage to talk about lending options, how you can finance your short-term rentals. We have James Daynard. If you guys don't know James Daynard, he is like a beast of a flipper. This guy is like an encyclopedia on how to rehab houses. He's flipped like, I don't know, like a thousand houses in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have my buddy, my buddy uh, Brian Davila, who's a, a flipper wholesaler here based out of SoCal. He's going to be talking about uh, finding deals. We have uh, Sarah and Annette from Thanks for Visiting. Uh, they're co-hosting uh, folks out on the East Coast. So just like a, 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 a stacked lineup of people that know everything short-term rentals. And our goal is that by the end of that two and a half day event, uh, people walk away with the confidence they need to go out there and start or keep scaling their, their short-term rental business. So if you guys want want tickets, we still have early bird pricing out. As of today, there's a $300 discount, but go to strsummits.com. Again, that's strsummits.com to get your tickets. Love it, man. Great plug. And um, we had Brian on the show, uh, episode 103, and he okay. was he's one of our top 10 episodes. So yeah. um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. We made it to the core four, so we can go a little rapid fire here. We just get to know you a little bit more personally, and we like to keep it a secret from some of our guests just to get the most organic answer that we can. So Let's do it. Um, some of them are easy. Some of them are more thinkers, but first one, what's your favorite business or real estate investing book that you would recommend? Um, I'm going to give you three. Um, none real estate related, all business related. I think there's enough information out there on real estate investing. Um, anyone can find that, but it's like, if you want to scale, you need to, you need to read business books. Um, so traction by Gino Wickman, fantastic book, uh, profit first by Mike Michalowicz. Love that book. And then Mike Michalowicz also has another book called uh, clockwork. Um, and those three books, man, if you, if you just read and implement those three books into your business, it, it's, it makes things significantly easier for you. I read profit first. That's the one of the, one of those I read. Yeah. Do any of these specifically help you systematize your business and just like get things in the right bucket? I'm, I'm just curious. Tra traction and clockwork, a billion percent. 
Perfect. Okay. That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, second question of the core four is, this is going to probably vary for you a little bit, but if you had an additional $50,000 of discretionary income, how would you say we, Corey and Ryan, just give you a check of 50 K today, not taxed. How would you use it? Whether it's spend it, invest it, uh, invest in yourself. Like you can do anything with it. What would you do with 50 K? Hire somebody. Um, there, there's still people that we need to add to the team. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you can invest a dollar into a team member and get back five. So, you know, I could probably take that 50 grand and turn it into, I don't know, what is that? 2.5 million, maybe. I don't know if I get the right people on my team, you know? Awesome. Cool. So what has been, Tony, what has been your biggest mistake in your investing journey and how have you learned from it? Um, biggest mistake. This one is, this one is a thinker. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard for me to really say that anything is a mistake um, because I feel like every decision that I've made in my business, I made with the best data that I had available to make that decision at the time. So it's not like all the signs are pointing to make this decision, but I said, screw that, I'm going to do this other thing over here. Um, the outcomes maybe not weren't what I wanted, right? Um, my second real estate deal, we lost 30 grand on that thing. Right. Um, but again, we we made the decision with the best information we had available at the time. So would I consider that a mistake? Maybe not. Did we learn some lessons from that? Of course. Um, so it, it, it's really hard for me to point to one specific mistake uh, or, or one specific outcome that I, I wasn't super happy with, because every single thing that's happened to me in my business so far has led me to the point that I'm at right now. And it's like, if I take away those things, would I be sitting here right now having this conversation with you guys? So anytime things don't give me the outcome that I want, it's more so about, okay, what, what lessons can we learn? How can we apply that to our, our future decisions? Yeah. I love that. Each, each failure is a stepping stone, right. To, to point you in the right direction. And, and yeah. the point is you didn't stop. And right. I think that's where people can point to their biggest mistake was just like stopping. They gave up and you didn't. Yeah. So kudos to you. And yeah. it's amazing to see what you're doing. And we don't talk about this enough. Like you legitimately cannot get to success without failure. Like I, it, it, totally. it's every time we make a mistake, it's almost like in sales with all these no's lead up to a yes. And I think about it all the time. It's like, it, you have to fail. And every successful yeah. person has said that, that they have failed their way to success. So um, it's kind of just part of the process. So I like that yeah. answer. You got right. If I can one. add one, I just want to add one thing to that, right? And this is something I, my, my son is 14 now. He, he's about to start high school actually, which is crazy. Um, but he, he plays basketball and uh, you know, he has a trainer that he works with and sometimes he'll be frustrated where he's working on like a new drill with his trainer, like a dribbling drill or something. And he's like losing the ball and, you know, he's like hanging his head low and doing all these things. And I'm, you know, I, I, I pick, you know, pick him up by his chin. I'm like, Hey dude, I was like, if you were able to do it perfectly, would you be getting better? And he's like, no. I was like, so then what does it mean that you keep losing the ball? He's like, it means I'm trying something I haven't tried before. And I was like, so don't you think that if you keep doing it, eventually you're not going to lose the ball. And he's like, yeah. I was like, then just keep losing the ball faster so you can get to that point, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you said that, man, because failure is, it is, it is ingrained in success. You can't get to success without failure. I, I just keep, sorry, well, I'm sorry. a basketball coach. So I, I, I resonate with that statement. And what we do with our players is like, if you're not drilling yourself to 98% capacity on a drill right. and you're, right. and you're not losing the ball, then you're not right. doing it right. If you're not trying exactly. things that you wouldn't like you, there's a certain amount of time that you have to try new things, to get them, to perfect them to the area that you need them to be, to be able to have them be game reps. Right. And that's mm -hmm. just, goes with anything in life. So if like, if you don't try the new thing in the game, bro, like it's not going to work right. then if you drill <laughs> right. it hard enough in practice and you fuck it up enough times, you're going to be able to have it more comfortable in the game. And it's similar to what you're mm -hmm. going through with your son. I think it's like, it's, it's the same thing. I, and I love that sentiment there because it's, it's hundred percent true. But I cut you off. No, it's not. You're the coach. I'm just thinking I, the, the only thing I could speak to is, is the Mamba mentality, right? You always hear the yeah. story of Kobe, you know, being in the gym at four in the morning, the day of a game before, and then he still right. shows up and, and put, puts up 60. So a little plug for him, Laura Marion, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, little, that's right. That's right close, around the corner from us. us. Um, but yeah, dude, I just think of that and like how much impact he's had on literally everyone, whether you play basketball or not. So that's cool. Very cool. One. But um, last one for the core four is what do you want your legacy to be? So what gets you out of bed every morning? What's your why? And, and I guess, why do you feel your why is so important to you? Yeah. Um, 
Man, well, you know, this is, a, this is a loaded question as well, but, you know, I've heard different really successful entrepreneurs say this. I've, I've heard Steve Jobs say it, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk has said it, but um, it's the fact that one day I'm going to die. Like my time on this earth is is limited. And in the grand, you know, I'm 31 right now. I'm, you know, about what, one third through my like living life, if I'm lucky, yeah. right? And just the thought of that scares me, Right. You think like, man, I'm I'm already 33% through the life that I have to live. And there's so many things that I want to do. So I, I think just that in the back of my mind all the time that like, hey, 33%, like that, that drives me to kind of keep going. Um, the second thing is that I want to have a life of impact. And like, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I like intermittently journal. And like, if I go back to my journals from like, I was in, in like my early 20s, it wasn't always just about the money. It was always also about the impact and inspiring other people and leaving a legacy of, of supporting other people to reach their own dreams and ambitions and goals and knowing that I played a small role in that. And you know, I have to pinch myself sometimes because I wake up and to a very small extent, I'm living that life. I get messages on Instagram or, or comments on my post, or I meet people in events and they, they shake my hand and they say, Tony, I've done X, Y, Z because of, of what you've shared. And that by itself makes me like emotional because it's like, man, that is what I've always wanted for myself was to help other people get to what they wanted. Um, so that, that's a big one for me as well. And then the last thing is just security, right? Like losing your job two days before Christmas, that'll scare the shit out of anybody. And, you know, I, I, one last story before, before I wrap up, because I think this is, this is relevant. Um, you know, I shared that I became a dad when I was 16. Right. So I, I obviously didn't have a career at 16. Right. I was a junior in high school. So, um, unlike most parents, I, 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 my son was with me as I went through that journey of high school to college, to, to getting that first job. And at one point it was, a uh, it was like, I don't know. My son was like three years old. I just graduated from high school. Um, I was working like some, you know, weak ass part-time job somewhere over the summer while, while, you know, like going to summer school for college. And I was flat broke, like dead broke, like negative money in the bank account. Right. And my son was, was sick. Like, you know, he, he had like a fever, he was throwing up. This is the first time he had gotten really sick like that. So, you know, whatever I, I, I we hop in the car, my air conditioner doesn't work, right? So it's like the middle of summer. It's like 100 degrees outside. We're both like sweating balls. I have to keep pulling over because he's like, Dad, I got to throw up. So we, we, you know, we finally get to the, to the doctor's office, right? And I, I go to check him in. I'm like, hey, you know, my, my son, he's three years old. He's been, been sick all morning. He's been throwing up. He's got a fever. I, I, I just need to get him checked in so we can see what we can do. And they're like, okay, cool. I give him his, med his, his like medical ID card. And they're like, hey, it's a $15 copay. And I'm like, can I pay that later? They're like, no, like we need, we need that payment now. And I, I told them, I was like, look, I literally have no money in my bank account right now. Like, is there anything, can you bill me? Like, can I do something? And they're like, I'm, I'm so sorry, sir, but we need that $15 today. So I had to call my, my son's mom, her and I aren't together. I had to call her and her husband and say, Hey, can you guys come meet me here at this hospital? So you can pay this $15 copay. And like, dude, I still get emotional telling that story because as a father, you always want to be able to take care of your family. And that moment stuck with me so much to think like, I didn't have $15, right? I didn't have 60 quarters to my name, right? So I had to call somebody else. So that moment drives me so much. I have this relentless fear inside of me to make sure I never get back to that point. So when you ask what drives me, that, that, that's a big part of what it is. That, that was maybe one of the best stories that anyone's ever told on our show. I really appreciate you you getting to that level and sharing it with us. I think it's amazing. The fact that that's driven you to want to help others is, yeah. is an incredible piece too, because a lot of people can take that and then be greedy with it and hold on to things and not want to have a life of abundance and share it with others. And um, I understand the point that you've gotten to with bigger pockets and people know who you are. Like it's a, it's a, it's kind of a big deal for us to be interviewing you. And we appreciate that. So in the small world that we live in, in the last um, couple of weeks, Rye got um, a, um, somebody recognized him at a wedding in Colorado and somebody came up <laughs> to go, me, man. somebody came out to me at the gym yesterday 
and I was working out and they were like, thank you so much for the podcast. Right. Like, I, you know, I listen to it every week. Like, and I was about to tap out on the amount of sets I did. I did a hundred more reps. I was like, <laughs> let's go. Like I was just like so hype on that and to get yeah. the feeling of like that I'm making that impact. And I, that's, I just wanted to go back to your point about impact that I am making that I'm so glad that that has that, that drives me because I now want to do more of that for other people. And I think that yeah. y- you come from a similar situation. The fact that you want to do that too, but thank you so much for sharing that story. I just had to throw that in the episode because if we, if we get recognized, God knows, I mean, like how many times people come up to you and say it. So you're doing something really, really good. If that's the life that you live, that people are thanking you all the time. And I think yeah, it's, um, you, you know, I know you've helped us in our personal journey. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So last drop. All right. We made it to the last drop, last segment of the show. Maybe you touched on this a little bit, but what advice would you give your younger self? Maybe you can go back to that 16 year old self um, and, and look him in the mirror or look him in the eye. What would you tell 16 year old Tony? My, my biggest advice to my, my younger self is to exercise more patience. I think I was so I need that right and now, Tony. So, um, and, and, and most people who are entrepreneurial do. Because we're, we're so driven. We want to move at 100 miles an hour. Uh, we want success today. We want success yesterday, right? And today is too late. So I, I always had this like pressure that I was putting on myself that, that I wasn't successful enough yet. And that can really mess with your psyche, you know? And, and I think it can drive poor decision making. Um, and it can, it can lead you to jumping ship too soon. Um, I tried so many different business ideas in my early 20s so many different business ideas, right? I had a blog uh, in the personal development space. I had this tutoring business. I was selling like stuff online, like any business idea you could think of, Tony tried it at one point or another. And it's because I wasn't really looking for something that aligned with what I was good at or something that aligned with what my, my values were or something that aligned with what, what I, I wanted out of my life. I was just looking for the money. And I, I think that actually slowed me down. Had I actually just exercised the patience to say, Tony, if you just stick with this one thing long enough, you'll eventually find success. I might be, you know, 10 steps ahead from, from where I am right now. So when we bought that first short-term rental, the one thing I told myself was, I'm not going to buy anything else for the next five years except short-term rentals. And I want to get really good at this one thing. And once I've done that, then I can venture off. Then I can do some other things. But I think most investors, most entrepreneurial people struggle with giving themselves patience. Yes. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that we, I can tell you that we do. And like, we have had so many opportunities for shiny object syndrome. I think we've done a good job of blocking most of them out, but we're not only doing real estate. And sometimes I think maybe that'll come back to bite us. Maybe it won't, but I just, I, I totally agree with that. Now we're focused on back on the real estate, which got us to the point that we are. Um, not that any investment that we've made, we have not made a significant mistake. I feel great about them all, but it's just that thing that, that one singular one focus, you know, the one thing that book, right. um, I agree with that. So thank you for sharing. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a blast. If if people want to learn more about you, maybe they want to invest with you. They want to um, just network with you. What's the best way for people to get in touch? Yeah. So uh, on Instagram, uh, Tony J. Robinson, uh, you guys can find me there. Uh, YouTube, The Real Estate Robinsons, me and my wife share everything short-term rentals. You guys want another amazing podcast to listen to, The Real Estate Rookie Podcast. You guys can search us up there. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about maybe investing with us, go to alphageekcapital.com. Perfect. Tony, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You dropped some knowledge on us, but selfishly for Corey and I, it was just great to get to know you and, uh, you know, I, now I can call you a friend. It's great. Yeah, guys, I appreciate you having me on. I hope your listeners got some good value from this. And I'm honored to be included as one of the guests you guys have had on the show because you guys have had some really heavy hitters so far. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice.